Well, as we come to the end of this week's conversation, we're going to be in verse 21. And this is a verse that has been really difficult for most people, especially when we talk about how we're to engage with the culture and the people around us, especially the people that are immediately around us. He says in verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And what we'll get into next week is how that introduces us into the most central element of what it means to be in relationship with other people. But this is a term that really uh, is difficult because in our culture, the idea of submission is the admission of weakness. And weakness is something that we try to avoid. We want to show ourselves as strong, competent, capable. And the idea of submitting ourselves to someone else, putting ourselves under their authority, in a sense, is antithetical to us. It just it feels sick and wrong, especially because all of us, all of us have experienced being under someone else's authority and having that authority used incorrectly or unfairly to cause harm and loss. And as a result, we have suffered. We've suffered soul damage many times because of being under the authority of somebody who abused that right of authority. Well, though, let's begin by talking a little bit about what this word submit actually means. Uh, it was originally a, a Greek military term that meant to arrange your, your troops in a military fashion under the commander or leader of a force. In other words, it's falling in ranks. The idea that you recognize someone as being the head, the captain, the leader, the general, the person who's in charge, and you submit yourself to him as your leader. That was the whole idea initially. It was just this, this idea of a military submission to the leadership of whoever is in command. But it, over time, took on a non-military use, as most words usually do. And it meant, literally, I, I think this is an interesting definition, a voluntary attitude of giving in, cooperating, assuming responsibility, and carrying a burden. We might say it's the idea of being part of the team. Now, I've known a lot of people who, I remember one pastor who I was friends with years ago, he used to talk about the importance of building a strong team, but I found that he liked teams as long as he was the team captain. But when he had, and when he wasn't the captain, then he really, really wrestled against the authority that was, was being put upon him. And one of the things you learn is that until you learn how to submit and serve, you really never learn what it means to lead. Um, at this point in my life, um, I can look back regretfully in many ways about the kind of pastor I was when I first and continue to be in ministry in first several years. I might even say for the first couple of decades. Um, it's not so much that I'm a narcissist. I, I have an other problem. I'm a codependent. And what that means is basically you worry too much about what other people think. Uh, you place too much expectation on other people. And when they disappoint you, you get upset with that. And I look at that and say, you know, there's a, there was really a failure on my part. I really recognize that uh, painfully many times. But the thing that's interesting to me is that one of the things that uh, helps us to understand how to lead more than anything else is having to be under the leadership of other people. Uh, that's why I think it's interesting that uh, I've told people who complain to me about the way they're raised, their parents, or, or even a church they were serving in, the way the pastor behaved and so forth. I have one simple question I ask him. I simply say, if you can identify what they did wrong, how is that translated in how you live your life? If you know what they're doing wrong, then you also should understand what right looks like. And what I find is a lot of people want to excuse themselves from doing the right thing by pointing out how somebody else did the wrong thing. I'll be quite honest when people come to me and say, you know, uh, I was going to thus and such church and, and they, they did this bad thing and that bad thing and I disagreed and so forth and so on. And, and I'm not asserting that they're uh, incorrect, that maybe their observation is valid. But my concern is always the same thing. I wonder how long it's going to be before they're saying those things about me. Because the reality, when you talk about a community of believers, you're talking about not necessarily people are hypocritical, but we are incredibly imperfect. We are way over on the imperfect side of things. We do things and get things wrong. We say things and and conclude things that are incorrect. I mean, that's just the nature of our human endurance. And that's why 
the ability to be merciful and forgiving is one of the key attributes of building a church, of building community, building a relationship, building a marriage, building a family. We don't expect perfection. What we do is recognize that uh, all men have feet of clay and they make mistakes. And so what he's saying here is that we need to come to a place where we recognize that being in leadership and being in charge is not easy and oftentimes it's a painful and thankless deed that no matter what you do, you're going to have some people who applaud you and you have other people who criticize you. That's just the nature of any kind of leadership. And you have to kind of get used to that. You kind of get to the place where you are more concerned with the applause of heaven than you are from the approval of men. But at the same time, we only really understand how we affect other people by having other people affect us. So we learn how to address people in a more gracious way when we have been spoken to in an ingracious way. And we ask ourselves, how would I have liked to have been addressed? How would I have liked that person to approach me? Uh, we only understand how, how vicious slander and backbiting and things like that, rumoring and gossiping are, uh, when we've been slandered or rumored or gossiped again. Then we, we know how painful it is and we can kind of step back and say, I need to realize that when I do the same thing, I'm affecting other people in the same way. And I don't want to be treated that way, so I'm not going to treat other people that way. Now, I wish that was a guarantee that it wouldn't happen, but the whole point is that you don't have to look back with regret and saying, yeah, I opened my dumb mouth and said too much or said the wrong thing. I should have kept that to myself. There's a lot of things that we say that could be handled in the prayer closet more effectively. I mean, if I'm upset with somebody, I can tell God at great length and express to him with great emotion how I feel and how angry I am and how unjust that was and blah, blah, blah. But once I've really done that, and then I've sat back and let God minister to my heart, well, one of the things that often happens is God says, well, remember when you did this and remember you said that and remember when you behaved this way? Remember how you reacted that time? You know, you're no better than they are. And so what you need to do is forgive them because you're guilty of those same things and you want to be forgiven. Now, one of the things I say, and I think it's, it's missed by a lot of Christians, is that that doesn't mean that we shouldn't establish boundaries. Uh, there are some people who are just not safe. And I don't mean that you shun them or you hate them, but at the same time, you don't engage them. And when they try to engage you, you keep it on a very superficial level. You don't try to speak into somebody's life who doesn't want to hear what you have to say. And so it's really, really important that uh, you don't overwork to have a relationship with somebody who just wants to basically prey upon you and use that relationship for their own selfish advantage. There's such an increase in our culture of what I call narcissistic sociopaths. A narcissistic sociopath is a person who has a tremendous amount of empathy for themselves, but really has no empathy at all for other people. And that happens within the church as well. And so we need to recognize those personality weaknesses because most of us are on the codependent side where we're trying to please other people and make sure they like us. We're more concerned with what they think to be, or think and believe to be true about us than we do about, that God does know, knows that's true about us. And that, that exchange is really important in Christian maturity that we begin to say, you know, Lord, you know my heart. And that's what David did in the Psalms. Over again, he said, God, you know my heart. But when it comes to really building a community and working with other people, there has to be an attitude of, of giving in. You can't just simply ins insist that everything be your way and that you're willing to cooperate and help other people, that you assume responsibility when you do something wrong, you made a mistake, and you're willing to carry the burden uh, that maybe somebody else doesn't have the strength to carry. When we operate in that sense of submissiveness, where we're really other-directed in our actions, our thoughts, our words, uh, it really is a healthy dynamic and builds the body of Christ. Uh, and I, I'm afraid that too often in the Christian community, we have allowed wedge issues, people's hurts, their losses, their resentments, their bitternesses, to begin to control the conversation, the narrative, and then they're surprised when community falls apart. So. All you and I can do is to try to do our part to build up and to edify and to avoid the things that tear down and weaken. Anyway, quite a challenging concept, but next week we're going to really begin to 
roll into what this means in specific areas as Paul goes on to talk about the relationships that are primary to our life, the relationship of husbands and wives, the relationships of parents and children, uh, our relationships in the workplace. He calls it slaves and masters, but it still applies. That these three are the key arenas where we live out our Christian life uh, most obviously, and they're the ones where the idea of submitting to one another is most critically important. So anyway, we'll pick up this conversation next Monday, and thanks for taking the time to listen to me bloviate. God bless you and go in his grace.